That gag. Let's uh, continue to, well, really particularly think into the hows now. So some key pieces that are going to help us lead our churches towards serving others. Now, there's going to be some overlap of what we already talked about, overlap into the case studies tomorrow. I think that's particularly helpful. Hearing the same things, different voices, uh, helps us take it in. Structure for the session. Firstly, to think about what, again, is it we're trying to achieve very briefly in this serving others piece of church life. But the bulk of the time we're going to spend on the how. How do we achieve it? And these are the eight big how headings that we're going to be uh, looking at over the course of um, this afternoon and also six this afternoon and uh, two, it's coming, and two on Thursday. So firstly, uh, what is it that we're trying to achieve when it comes to the serving others piece of church life? See, we've already heard that what often happens when we think about the serving others piece of church life, like so many pieces of church life, is they can tend to devolve down to a pale reflection of what the Bible paints for us. And so, when we think about um, the serving others outcomes we're trying to achieve, often it tends to devolve down to get people into ministry spots fill holes on rosters. Now, that's important. You've got important ministries to run. If you get the people to fill the spots, you're pretty thankful. That's a good goal. But it's a fairly impoverished goal if that's our big goal. What are we actually after when it comes to serving this serving others piece of church life? A lot of helpful input already. But here's a bit of a shot at it. And you've got uh, also a hand out there. What we're after is an increasing number of disciples growing in glad, humble, sacrificial service of others, working together as a church for effective gospel ministry. Two sides intimately connected with each other. Side one, an increasing number of disciples growing in humble, glad, sacrificial service. Side two, working together as a church for effective gospel ministry. Two sides intimately tied together. Bit one is about individuals and discipleship. It's about growing, serving others' disciples. And bit two is about how these serving others' disciples work together as a church for effective gospel ministry. That is to make more disciples and deeper disciples. Do you see how big the goal we've been talking about today is? And that at its heart, it is a discipleship goal, not filling ministry spots or holes in rosters. It's about growing all of God's people deeper as disciples, disciples who are serving others' disciples glad, sacrificial, humble servants. And bit one is intimately tied to bit two, which is also a discipleship goal. The serving others area of church is all about these disciples working together effectively as a church for the cause of the gospel. So it's together, as the disciples work together, there's an energy, a synergy that's created as their gifts come together that makes much bigger difference than one or two serving or them all serving separately. And it's about people serving together for the cause of the gospel, the cause of the gospel going forward and changing people's eternal destinies. And we want it to be effective ministry. The serving others area of church life is to pursue effective ministry. So not only growing each disciple as a serving other's disciple, but also as a more effective servant. And so each ministry is a more effective ministry. And so our churches is as effective they can be under God in the getting of growing disciples. Are you getting a picture of what we've talked about? It's the Macedonian vision in this serving others piece of church life. We want to cultivate in all our people a lifestyle of generous, loving service. Our people, like our God, exhibiting loving service wherever they go, whatever they do, generous, servant-hearted people. They're known in the community as people of love and generosity. But we also want our people to have a central focus to their loving service, just as the Lord does. The greatest act of love is the act of changing people's eternal destinies by sharing the gospel. The greatest act of love is to be engaged in the work of the Lord, to be engaging and supporting the work of getting the word of God into people's lives, to see non-Christians saved, Christians kept and grown. And so we want our people to have this central focus, laser vision, prioritizing the cause of the gospel. Loving people, serving wherever they go all the time, but a clear-minded, focused attention to the work of the gospel, that loving service in their lives, a whole life of service. That's what we're trying to achieve. So how? How do you achieve it? One, stir our people's hearts and set a vision for serving. That is, build within us a deep inner 
conviction and passion, a heat within our church so that the culture of our church becomes, we serve like the Lord has served us. That's just who we are. Now, how do you build this conviction? I think often what people think you do is you talk lots about serving. So, preach lots about serving. Have lots of applications about serving. Have Bible studies on serving. Uh, when you interview someone about the, uh, up the front, interview them about their serving and the impact that it's had for the cause of the gospel. At your newcomers' night, talk about serving. Uh, make incidental comments that champion, glad, humble, sacrificial service. Perhaps have a Serve Sunday, which is all about serving, gives people the opportunity to jump in and serve. All these pieces are, are helpful. However, if overdone, can actually harden people against serving. It's more counterintuitive. There's actually a bigger way to stir people's hearts, and, and we've heard a bit about it. What is it that really builds serving passion and conviction within our people? It's the gospel. Grasping the wonder of the gospel, the cause of the gospel, and seeing the gospel change people's lives. What gets our people serving is being stirred by the wonder of the gospel. How can I not serve when my heart is bursting for, uh, for understanding all that the Lord has done for me? being stirred by the cause of the gospel. How can I not serve when I see that the cause of the gospel is so great that it changes people's eternal destinies? And being stirred by seeing the impact of the gospel in people's lives. How can I not serve when I'm seeing people come from death to life, hell to heaven, when I'm seeing Christians' lives transformed by the gospel? The most fundamental thing that stirs our people to serve is the gospel. And so, to get people serving, you don't just talk about serving stories, about serving, though that's a piece. To get people serving, you talk passionately about the gospel and the cause of the gospel and the impact of the gospel. That's the most fundamental thing that fuels serving the serving other areas, piece of, others piece of church life. Saturating our churches with the gospel. Now, there's a piece that's, that's, that's intimately, directly tethered, tied to that, and that is... Having every area of church, your church ecosystem functioning effectively, driven and shaped by the gospel. We've got the church um, ecosystem graphic. Think about this. If your loving God area of church life is humming, so that your people deep in their hearts, they, they love the Lord, they want the Lord honoured above all things, then how could they not give themselves to service, to honour the Lord and to see others love and honour the Lord like they do? Or, if your deep in the word area of church life is, is really going well, then people are so stirred by the Word of God, then they're moved to serve. And they so love the impact that the Word of God is making on their lives, they want to get that Word into other people's lives in any way they can. Now, I could talk about the on-mission area and the in-community area and the serving others area. The thing that fuels serving heat is a healthy, functioning church ecosystem. It's not a silver bullet, it's, it, it's every piece driven and shaped by the gospel. This is what will actually draw our people to be gladly sacrificial, to be those who die to themselves so that others might live. Imagine this, I could visit your church and I walked around and I just saw heaps of people serving all over the place. And I could walk up to anyone at one of them and I just said to them, hey, why are you doing this? Didn't need to think about it, didn't need to formulate an answer. They just said something like, oh, the Lord has given so much to serve me, how could I not serve? in this way, serve others. Oh, and the work that we're part of is, is the work of eternity. What else would I be doing with my time? Wouldn't that be something? It's the Macedonian vision. One, stir our people's hearts and set a vision for serving. Two, create and prioritise serving opportunities and needs within church. So before we even think about inviting, recruiting people into ministries, we need to determine what ministries should we be running. And I have to say, every church has a way of prioritising ministry needs. You're doing it whether you know you're doing it or not. It's seen by how you apportion your budget, what your staff and key leaders spend their time and energy doing, what ministries you're recruiting for, what gets the focus and the energy in your church life. However, often the approach of churches is reactive. We inherit a way that church has done things and we continue to do things the way they've always done them. Or we think about how would I do them and we think into our past ministry experience and the best models of ministry we've seen and we just do the same things that we've seen done. Reactive. And sometimes those models, unfortunately, aren't the best. 
And so as leaders in a church, we can be working very hard, very hard, but without much to show for it as a church. Instead, it's far more powerful if we can get on the front foot and, and take in, be intentional and proactive in our approach to thinking about how we will run ministries, what ministries we will run. To start with, as you will have heard in Foundations, to start with the end in mind, the big goal, uh, an increasing number of mature disciples, more disciples, deeper disciples. But then to take that big goal and break it down into what are the key pieces that form a healthy church ecosystem that contribute towards that end? And then thinking, what ministries will I build to build this healthy church ecosystem? So that it all works towards the end of making more and deep disciples. And you know, you, you can't build everything at once and you can't build everything you want to. And so you have to think, what's next? What's next? Stage it. To think things like, what ministries will we run and what ministries won't we or we need to stop running? What part of church fuels church life, fuels the work and so we need extra energy added into that part? What part multiplies the work? What part needs urgent attention if in the next year we're going to make some real progress in this church? Now, this all requires you to think about how are we structured now? What are the ministries we're currently really doing? And then to think about where should we be heading? How should we structure things? And a helpful way to do this is just to draw up an organisational chart, an org chart, just to actually sketch on paper what are we actually doing as a church? What are all the ministries? How do they hang together? And sometimes that just surprises you that there's no leadership here and this one doesn't connect there and no one communicates there. But it also shows you this is who we are. This is, this is the reality of now. And then thinking about where do we need to get to? To draw a new picture of the org chart. Where do we want to get to in the next year, the next two years, the next five years? And then to think about how we get there. Now, it's just the, the, the now, where, how process which we've um, talked about often at REACH, so helpful, so simple. Where are we at now? Where do we need to get to? And then you think, how are we going to make that transition? How are we going to get there? See, once we have our priorities, we then know that's where I'm going to put my staffing hours. That's where the money goes. That's where the serving energy of my volunteers goes. That's what we're going to recruit for so that we don't waste time that's not contributing to the cause of the gospel. And so if we lead well, we're going to keep making decisions in light of our priorities and saying yes to some ministries and no to others because the good is the enemy of the best. Knowing our priorities will help us make decisions about where people should go and be recruited to because you know this, there's only so many people able to serve and there's so much that we wish we could be doing as a church. It's the um, bed and the, the blanket illustration. I don't like blankets, so the bed and the doona illustration. Who sleeps under a blanket? A doona? The, the bed is all the ministries of church that we want to run, and the doona is, is the volunteer hours that we have to run them, the, the resource, the staffing that we have to run it. Usually in church, we're trying to run a, a, a double bed-sized ministry, but the volunteers that we have is a, is a single doona. And so what happens is, is you pull it, you roll one way and you pull it one way and your wife's uncovered and she's unhappy. She pulls it the other way, you're uncovered, you're unhappy. There never seems to be enough people to run all the things that we'd love to run. What are the solutions? Well, you increase the size of the doona, get more people, more people serving. You reduce the size of the bed, take out the circular saw and just cut off a piece of the bed. <laughs> cut the ministries down. Or recognise that there'll be times where someone just needs to go cold for a while. <laughs> Generally, we're always trying to increase the size of the doona, aren't we? Get more people serving. Generally, in church life, there will always be someone going cold. There will always be ministries that are undermanned. And sometimes we need to be courageous and actually cut ministries. Proactive leadership will be thinking about these things. Which ministries can we allow to go cold for a while? Which ministries do we need to stop? Now, very briefly about scale. I won't say much because tomorrow we'll break into case studies, which will be um, around scale, around church size, which will be particularly helpful. But just to note, if you're a small church run by one senior leader, all these decisions are happening in your mind. You're making the decisions about which ministries to run and which shouldn't and which are going to go cold for a while. I'll run this, I'll run this, this one will go cold, won't have enough volunteers, but over time once this gets going, I'll move them over here. You, you're making all those decisions in your head. 
you start to grow or if you started with an eldership or a team, the decisions that used to happen in the senior minister's head now happen in a team meeting. More complex, but important. It's a shift. You grow larger still, you have a larger staff team, far more people, far more ministries, much more complicated. Go to that one tomorrow. Two, create and prioritise serving opportunities and needs within church. Three, develop an intentional recruiting strategy. In talking about intentional recruiting, we're particularly talking formal ministries. And as has been said, sometimes there's pushback against formal ministries. Shouldn't we just release our people, let them out in the community, community so they love and serve and do evangelism everywhere? The thing is, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> It's actually the people who serve in formal ministries of church who tend to do far more informal ministry. It's a bit like exercise. Now, ten people say, oh, don't lock me into any formal exercise. I don't want part of a gym. I don't want to go to a class. I don't want to do any of that sort of stuff. I'm just going to exercise informally whenever I want. Nine out of ten never do any exercise. <laughs> Rather... It's the, it's, it's the people who join the gym, 10 people join the gym, join the exercise class, and you find actually 8 out of the 10 of them, they do the exercise at the gym where they never would have done any exercise, but it also starts to bleed into their life where they think, I want to be a healthy person. So they go for walks, they go for runs. They Formal ministry actually gets you serving, but it also equips people to do more informal ministry. And so we need to determine an intentional recruiting strategy for our formal ministries. Initially, recruiting to ministry often happens when a solo pastor can't get all the jobs done that they need to do, or there's a whole bunch of things they don't like or can't do. So, I'm preaching, Sunday school happens at the same time as preaching, I can't be the Sunday school leader, I need someone to lead the Sunday school. Or, I've got accounts to do, I have no idea about accounts, I need to find someone who's an accountant to run my accounts. Or, we need a music ministry, I'm tone deaf, I need to find someone who can actually lead the music. So we recruit. Uh, we're clear about the needs, we're obviously very motivated to fill the needs, and the roles that we're recruiting people to are very clear to us, and we can make them clear to them. So we recruit, but it doesn't take a lot of intentional thought. However, once those obvious needs of churches are filled, Sunday school teachers, music, accounts, small group leaders, a few other things, often churches stop growing because the basic needs are filled and there's no intentional strategy to keep drawing people into formal ministries and because the senior minister is the one who has been responsible for the recruiting and is very time poor and so can't actually focus on it. And if we're recruiting, we usually end up, as we heard, asking the same people to do things more and more and more because they say yes and they're the only ones that we know. See, churches <laughs> often have this highly centralised model of recruiting. That is, recruiting happens through the senior minister or a, a small leadership team or an eldership. Now, massive strengths to that, it's very safe. You've got a lot of control about who is going where. The big downside is it's very slow and it caps out. It caps out growth because it limits the people we can recruit to the circle of relationships around the senior minister or the small uh, group of leaders. And so potential growth, gospel growth, is slowed. Congregational initiative to recruit is discouraged and then totally lost. And people end up just doing jobs on rosters who have been placed there by the senior leader or leadership team or eldership. Now, you can flip your recruiting system totally the other way. That is a free market. Any leader can ask any person that they want to be part of their ministry. Or, even further, any member can ask anyone to be join the ministry with them. Let each area recruit whoever they want. Now, there's power in this. It's quick. It's nimble. You ask people. You plug them straight in. And it's not bottleneck through one person or through a small group. It's highly decentralised. You now have a massive team of recruiters all the way across church. And each area feels empowered and motivated to get the recruiting done, which builds ownership and responsibility uh, to recruit people into your ministry. However, there's obviously the issue of control. You don't have quality control. And so people who are not godly enough can be placed into ministries where you really want someone godly. 
or someone who is not aligned with you theologically, philosophically, is placed into a ministry where they have a great degree of influence, which can be dangerous. Or people who are not gifted are placed into ministries where they really need to be gifted, so leading singing. (laughs) Second issue with the free market is that some areas in church life will always win. Some areas in church life find it easy to recruit for a number of reasons. Sometimes the, the leader is just a better recruiter, they're just better able to do it. Some ministries are easier to recruit for because they're a, a, an easier ask, they're more enjoyable, they're less costly to be, be a part of. Some ministries are easier to recruit for because they're very visible or they have access to people. So it's just not a level playing field when it comes to recruiting volunteers. And so the danger is that all the more glamorous ministries can flourish, along with those led by people with the pulling power, or who are ferrets like me, who just get out and ferret and find people to recruit into their ministries. (laughs) So what do you do? Generally, a hybrid works best. As free market as you can go, with a degree of centralised review and control. That is, and I have to say, there are times when you want to scale it, slide the dial one way or the other. Sometimes more towards the free market will give you growth, sometimes more towards control will give you growth. It's not static. But, but it's helpful to recognise this. For most of us, for most evangelical reformed churches, we tend to operate very far down the control end of the spectrum. And it's hurting our growth as churches. And so I believe if we choose a hybrid model which allows a fair degree of free market but with some controls, it will help us dramatically. And generally, the other piece to add to this this, um, hybrid model is is some push and some pull. So you want leaders doing the recruiting work, the the ferreting out of leads and, and pushing people towards ministry, the push. But you also want some pull, a way where people can opt into ministry, say, I'd be keen to, and they can put themselves in. Both pieces are helpful. Four, help people get into serving. Now, I'm actually going to leave this one. Uh, there's great stuff in the Serving Others ebook, so, so do read that um, during or after the conference. There's going to be a bunch of great stuff in the case studies uh, tomorrow, so go along to those. All I'm going to say is what's already been said, when it comes to helping get people serving, the key thing is a conversation a conversation, looking them face to face and talking with them in a way with the goal of helpfully and healthily landing them into a ministry team, but also a conversation that in that moment is discipling them and setting up them up for the best next steps for discipleship uh, in your church. And so it's going to be important to think into a bunch of things like who's going to have these conversations? What are these convos going to look like? Uh, at what point in them coming to church will we have these sort of conversations with them? What ministries are there available to them? And how am I going to make sure that we cover everyone with these conversations? And as soon as you start thinking about things like that, you realise, man, we're going to need databases, lists of ministries, lists of the needs, perhaps a pathway into church life. I'll leave it there. Whet your appetite. More in the case studies tomorrow. Five, build healthy, functioning team life. Once we're clear on what ministries we should be running because we've got priorities... And we're getting people into these ministries, recruiting. The big question is, what's the best approach to achieving the outcomes of these ministries? And I'm thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly convinced that the most effective way to achieve these outcomes in almost all ministries is healthy teams. Teams who work together to keep clear, keep each other clear on the outcomes they're trying to achieve. And teams who work together to design and implement strategies to achieve those outcomes. Churches have traditionally taken a roster-based approach to ministries. Now, can I just say, rosters are good things. <laughs> They're not bad things. You run teams, you will still use rosters in the running of teams. However, I think a roster-based approach to ministry is in almost all circumstances far less effective than a team-based approach. What's the difference? With a roster-based approach, there are a bunch of jobs to do. Someone coordinates the roster and people fill the roster and do those jobs. So, you know it, I, 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 I'm going to be on once every six weeks. Um, I give my availabilities for that. The coordinator coordinates the roster. I know which week I'm on. I come, I do my job that week. I go home and I don't need to think about it for the next six weeks. The coordinator is the one who takes charge, who does the heavy lifting in terms of taking responsibility. 
the coordinator coordinates the roster and I just sort of come and do my bit and then go home. In contrast, when I'm part of a healthy team, I belong to a group and this is our thing. Still as a leader, but a key role of the leader is, is to grow ownership of the team so that we share the responsibility for achieving the outcomes that we are after. We each own them together. And so it's not I do my job and go home. No, no, I, I'm always thinking about it. I'm part of this team. We talk about them together. We have meetings together. We plan things for this ministry together. We celebrate together when it goes well. And when things don't go well, we think about and talk about how are we going to fix this? What are the best ways forward? We care about the ministry working well and we care about it working better and better in achieving the outcomes we're trying to achieve. Incredible ownership. I reckon in almost all circumstances, team-based ministry is the way to go. Um, I could give you a whole list of things, reasons why. Let me give you three very briefly. One, teams achieve larger outcomes and create greater responsibility. I'd love to say more, but teams achieve larger outcomes and create greater responsibility. Two, teams are highly relational. They build relationships and they have built into them support and camaraderie. Three, teams are discipling vehicles because you have a group of people with a leader over and so you can train the leader to be discipling that group. But also, it's another place where you get Christians together, often working on the job, talking to each other about their lives, what's going on, and encouraging each other in their walk with Christ. Let's move into our final point for today, which is uh, develop leaders. Sixth thing to do. Uh, the, the development of leadership is critical to our work and actually if we fail in that work, the growth of our churches will be stifled. And so I want to give uh, four key thoughts when it comes to developing leaders. And the first one is this, personally make leaders. You think if you start from scratch, how do I start making leaders in our church? Well, it probably starts with you. And there's a couple of ways to do it, from within a team and from outside the team. From within the team, which I really love, is where you step into a ministry team and you lead the team. And then you pull alongside you uh, someone who you're going to train, a leader in training. And over time, you model it to them, you show them how it's done, you then give them opportunity, feedback. And over time, you train them up and then you step out. I, I think that's a fantastic model because it's got built into it feedback and together and modelling and a whole bunch of things. But the, the key thing is you're working yourself out of a job so you can step somewhere else, start another team do a new ministry, do, do something else. The other approach is from outside the team, that is you, you don't step into a team, you appoint a leader and they, they do the work of leading the group, but you, you work closely with them. You continue to give them support, uh, watch them in action, uh, give them some feedback, input, those sort of things. Uh, and both are important. You won't always have time to step into the team and do that approach, even though I think that's powerful. Sometimes you'll need to appoint leaders and manage them from without. What I tend to like to do is to jump into a team and, and train a leader and then leave, train another leader and leave, train another leader and leave. But each time you leave, continue to lead those leaders or give support to those leaders from outside. So I start from within and I move towards without. Um, now, there are some things that you must do in church life and not give away as leaders, either because of your gifting you're just so gifted, you should be doing that thing. Or, because they're critical to the effectiveness of you leading your church. However, they're fairly few. The vast majority of the things that we are doing in churches, I would encourage you to always be trying to train someone else to do. Always be having someone alongside you so that you can multiply the ministry. Build, pass it on. Build, pass it on. Build, pass Group together, train someone to lead them, pass it on. Empower others. Um, as we've heard, a big problem with us as senior leaders is that we love to be at the coal face. There's things we just love doing and we don't want to let go of, but that's a blockage. We need to die to ourselves, let go of some of the things we love doing so that we can train others into those roles and multiply the work. And so, learn to be more of a multiplier rather than just a doer of ministry. Second, while we personally need to make leaders, we need to create a system that makes leaders. Because if it's all up to us doing it personally, it'll be too slow, we, we, we're stuffed. We need a system that multiplies the leaders. That is creating a leadership eco development ecosystem. So that leadership development is just part of the DNA of church. 
Training is happening everywhere all the time. A training culture where everyone just lives and breathes training, like a training hospital. In a training hospital, everyone's doing their job, but at the same time of doing their job, they've got someone alongside them who is also learning to do their job. Every nurse, every doctor, every wards person, every accountant is doing their job and simultaneously training someone else to do it. Imagine if we could create churches like that. Churches that were training churches built into the very DNA. Third, understanding how to make leaders. And this point is one that I just particularly want to highlight and underline and bold. I really want you to hear it because I actually think there's a lot of haziness when it comes to thinking about how do you actually train someone, train a leader? How are people effectively trained? I generally think when we talk about training as churches, we mean run a night, run a course. Oh, we did some great training on that. Ah, oh, we need to get people together so that we can give them some training on that. And by training, we usually mean a talking head, <laughs> giving content, content delivery, that sort of thing. Now, while this is very, very, very important, I think if that's the extent of our training, it's very, very, very anemic. How is it that people are actually trained? Well, the first thing is to provide good content. So it's hard to know what you're supposed to be doing if someone hasn't told you or shown you how to do it. And so good content, content can be spoken content, a training video, a training night, a training course, a, a, a talking head talking up the front somewhere, or someone talking you through your role. Good content, spoken. Or good content can also be modelled. That is, someone shows you how to do the role. Best is both, spoken and modelled. And so a big question for each of us is, is this, how do I continually get good content to all the leaders in my church? But there's a second key piece, and I reckon this one is very, very, very overlooked, and it is, add to content, practice. Do the thing over and over and over and over again, because practice makes at least okay. <laughs> I, I, I do a little bit of karate with my kids, <laughs> <laughs> they started years before their black belts and everything. I'm woeful. But it's great exercise and, and good for f showing me how inflexible I am and lots of fun to do stuff with my kids. But if I didn't practice the same moves, the same moves, the same moves, I'd never learn how to do it. But I tell you what, you do it over time and you actually do get a little bit better. Same in church. You want someone to learn to be a good Bible study leader or a good kids ministry leader, or a good sound operator, then they need to do the same things again and again and again. And so one of the key pieces to creating a training ecosystem is to, to pay attention to creating opportunities for practice, opportunities for on-the-job training, opportunities for have-a-go training. And so a big question for all of us is, how can I provide consistent opportunities for people to have a go at ministries I want them to develop in? How can I give them lots of practice? Add to content and practice, reflection. If you can help people be reflective, then the gains they get from their practice accelerate dramatically. Because someone's able to uh, uh, um, reflect on how they've done, goes into the next practice, the next opportunity, thinking about how I want to do this bit better. And so each time they practice, they intentionally improve on the things they know they aren't doing well from their reflection. So a big question for each of us is, how can I help my people be self-reflective? Uh, we've got a little um, tool, actually, we just started using in the growth group world, but it, it's great for ministries, and it's, it's so good because it's so simple. Good, grow, go. Just get every leader thinking after anything they do, good, grow, go. What was good? What could I grow in? What am I going to go and do? First two are self-reflection. What was good? Really positive. What could I grow in? starts to step into the how could I do things better, go. How can I actually go and implement it? Helps practice. Add to these pieces feedback, which is generally just someone else helping you be reflective if you're not able to do it yourself. Good, warm, positive, supportive feedback, which gives you things to work on so next time you practice, you get better much more easily. So a big question for each of us is, how can I get every person who's having a go at a role receiving feedback from someone more experienced. So a team leader training team members, a team leader training a leader in training, perhaps an area leader supporting and training a number of team leaders. Who's giving feedback? Now, if you get this far, you've got a pretty amazing leadership uh, training system in your church, something fairly amazing. A leader development system that gives people good content, 
provides opportunities for practice, helps them be self-reflective and provides feedback. But I think we can go a couple of more steps if you're up for it. You can add peer learning. It's something that we're doing together at this conference. As you get together, leaders who are doing similar things and they talk about their experiences, they sharpen one another. Those who've been leading longer can pass on their insights and wisdom to those who haven't been leading for very long. Those with strengths in certain areas can pass those on and those with strengths in other areas can pass those on. And so it's great if you can get leaders of the same level together and create a peer learning environment, a powerful part of any church ecosystem. It doesn't need to be a separate thing. A lot of these pieces that I'm saying can actually all be down together. So a big question for us is, when do I get leaders together so they can talk together and learn from each other about their roles? And finally, we can add support structures. People develop best when they feel safe, when they feel supported, when they have everything they know to do that they needed to do their role. They feel secure. And so if we can develop good support stu structures around leader, they are better able to do their roles. It's like the, the plant leaning on the stake so that it can grow strong and safe and solid because of the support structure next to it. Now, some of the supports that we can provide are things we've already talked about. Good content. Someone to give them support and feedback and providing a cohort of peers to talk with and some good meetings and the like. But there are other elements of support that we can also provide. That is things that help them in their particular ministry. So, a kids' ministry leader might have some helps to prepare them for their lesson for kids' ministry. We could provide some Bible study preparation materials to help our leaders prepare for their Bible study. A short video taken on our phone, just talking people through the week to come and how you would lead in that particular ministry or circumstance. Anything that helps our leaders feel supported and creates these support structures so that they can continue to grow is particularly helpful. Fourth and finally, train leaders in all three key areas. What are we trying to train our leaders in? Now, it might sound obvious. Surely we're training our leaders to do the ministry that they're supposed to be leading in very well. That is, if they're the welcoming team leader, surely they need to be trained to do welcoming really well. Actually, there are three big categories when it comes to leadership training. Three big competencies. One, we want to train them as disciples. We want to grow them as disciples and leaders to be developed as those who develop others as disciples, which is often actually neglected in our leadership development in our ministries. Second, we want to give them any ministry-specific training they need. And so to lead a band, they will need to understand things about musicology and how to lead a band and a whole bunch of things I'm not aware of. You need to train them in ministry-specific things. But three, you particularly need to train leaders in generic leadership skills. Generic leadership skills. Training on how do you actually be a leader? How do you actually lead? Things like delegation and empowering and how to run a good meeting and how to give vision and develop strategy and a bunch of other things like that. So imagine this. You, you, you compare recruiting a Sunday school team member to recruiting a Sunday school team leader. What are you going to train each of them to do? It's not the same, is it? There are fundamentally different skills to being the team member to the team leader. The team member is going to be doing things, needs to be training things like relating well to the kids, running a cracker game, running a great Bible study. What does the team leader need to be trained in? communicating well with the team, running briefing and debriefing meetings, giving vision for why the team are serving, giving instructions for the different members in their roles, giving feedback. All these are generic leadership skills. Generic in the sense, once you've learned them in the kids' ministry, you can then step over and apply them into the youth ministry, you can then step over and apply them into the welcoming team ministry. They're generic team leadership skills. And so we need to train our leaders in all three key areas. Well, that's, that's all for today. Thursday, we're going to come back. We're going to, do, going to do build leadership layers and pipelines and track progress and make changes as needed. But um, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Let's pray. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Father, this, this area of church life is, is difficult. Uh, please give us wisdom courage, energy to press forward in this area. 
And please, Lord, grow all our people into disciples who are glad, humble, sacrificial servants. And please, Lord, grow our churches to be effective in their work of making mature disciples in ever-increasing numbers. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.